Hello, I thought I'd give you a little update on sort of what we've done to prepare for a possible pandemic and food shortages here at our little village lot in the interior of Canada. And I'm Alex Smith. So here we go. These are our six chickens. And uh, <clears throat> we just got them in March, sort of in a rush as it looked like there were going to be egg shortages and possible meat shortages so we got these four months old and they're a type of isa brown i would say and we got them through another local farmer who orders chickens that age they laid within three weeks so what they are in right now is a homemade chicken tractor it's got little wheels at the back there's a lid at the top where i can open it up and put in greens for them that I'm, as I weed all through the day, I'm putting greens in for the chickens. There's a little bit of a plastic box put on the back if they ever wanted to lay an egg during the day, but they never do. And a rope to pull it, and uh, you can yank this around the yard. But mo most of the time, uh, it's attached to their main run, which I also built on the fly with the materials that I could get as things closed down for the pandemic. and not wanting to build a whole new chicken coop, what I did was I put their coop into the side of an existing tool shed that I had here. You can see there's two doors that open up and a ramp that goes up in there. So chickens have a little bit of shelter for the winter snow and um, they're working out really well. We're getting six eggs a day from six chickens and that's as good as it gets. Now over here we have a large 255-gallon uh, water tank. It's been there for two or three years. Uh, we're in kind of a dry desert area, and some years we have droughts. And if it gets bad enough, the village uh, prohibits everything, uh, watering your lawn, but also at the worst stage, which hasn't happened yet, but could, uh, watering your garden. So we have more barrels of water coming off our east troughs. This comes off our east troughs for the house. Uh, we have about 500 gallon water capacity, so we could always do our gardens as needed. All right, well, let's just see if we can take a bit of a, a tour here. Certainly the chickens were the biggest changes that we made uh, coming into this pandemic thing. Uh, I put a couple of vents up there for them, and it's open into the shed itself, so if I want to cool them off on a hot day, I can just open this door you can see it's open up at the top there all I did to separate them from the rest of the shed was uh, put up a piece of plywood and uh, you can see their nesting boxes are right there they do actually lay in these boxes I'm thrilled and all chickens will some of them want to lay out on the floor or on the ground but uh, these ones uh, do lay right down in there and so I'm thinking that this whole arrangement will help me keep them warmer in the Canadian winter when it can be quite cold but they do need a lot of air so uh, I have different systems where I can give them a vent now I've got all their food is in that big metal barrel and we do keep this door closed because well, we occasionally get bears in this area and they would love to get down into these bags of chicken feed that I've got stored down under the coop I have enough chicken feed in this coop uh, in total in the shed uh, for about six months of chicken feed so uh, that's in case things go bad and there's so many people raising chickens sometimes the feed can be hard to find that's an elderberry bush you can make elderberry jam or elderberry wine we've got some raised beds that I built a few years ago but actually I'm moving away from raised beds they're good if you've got back problems uh, or you're a senior who can't bend at all but um, I'm finding I can grow more food in the same area without the raised beds. There's just less waste space and they actually do better. Those are herbs that are right there. I've got a bunch of beans that uh, are coming up and then some vegetable greens over there. Some beets. Those are turnips. They've gone nuts, you know. Uh, a lot of green there. And uh, all sorts of beets and lettuce and carrots. I have carrots and other root crops in another garden so these are sort of the kitchen garden and down here 
These beans I planted two weeks later than the other ones, and then where you see those wires, there's more beans planted two weeks after that. Try and get a succession so we keep getting beans all through into the fall if we can. Brassicas over there, uh, you know, cabbage and uh, cauliflower and that kind of thing. And, uh, well, it's past asparagus season, so our asparagus has gone to seed. Over there, more brassicas. You can see that I've put that old garden gate up against a wooden frame, and that's because we get really strong winds come whipping through here now and then. And I wanted some wind protection for the plants that are in that area. That's where it seems to be needed. Got tomatoes in there this year, and something different in there last year. And I can string them up to the wooden frame at the top, and uh, that allows a lot of tomatoes without them going all over the place and reduces the disease as well. That spinach grows up every year and it's basically replanted itself every year. I don't worry about that. Got some celery, onions, potatoes, that kind of thing. But as you can see, all this ground is being used. There's not very much space required for paths there. But we do have main concrete paths here and just concrete patio stones. I bought a whole flat of them and truck them in here because I like to come through here with my wheelbarrow. I've always got it full of manure and all sorts of stuff so I need at least a couple of pathways that I can count on without having to weave them all the time. Uh, these potatoes are indeterminate potatoes. They're uh, Pontiac and I think yes I see a Colorado potato beetle right there and I gotta kill it. You gotta get these as soon as you can. Oh, there's a whole bunch of them. See these two right here? They're mating. They're going to put little orange eggs all over my plants and kill them. So I've got to kill the beetles first. And uh, that's something to watch out for. And if you can kill them while they're adults, you'll save yourself a lot of time and trouble later. Down here along the tomatoes, I've sprinkled just randomly some... Uh, edible lettuces and things that make your salads more interesting and I'll let that go. Here are my raspberries. They were 8 to 10 feet tall last year. That was too much. I had to climb up a ladder to pick them so I cut them way back and I also took away about 20 percent of the plants. Dug them up in the spring, got them out to give them more room to grow in their roots. You can see down here I've got some aluminum flashing around the raspberries and that goes down about a foot and a half that's not really deep enough, but that's what I had, and it does discourage them. I still have a few runners get out, and I have to beat them up uh, and get rid of them. Here we've got uh, strawberries, and more strawberries. Those are in an old raised bed that I had there. They don't do any better, and in fact, the strawberries that are not in the raised bed are doing better than those in the raised. Um, here we have Mr. Apple Tree, the only tree that was on this property when we bought it. And uh, we get loads and loads of apples. This tree's been here since the early 1980s. And uh, I get more apples than I can use. We end up giving a bunch away. More potatoes. Why potatoes? Because if you have enough potatoes in a cool basement, which I have, you'll never starve. So these are good uh, depression and uh, pandemic things to be growing. These ones over here... Uh, Potatoes too, but they are Yukon Gold. I love Yukon Gold, but they are determinant. So where the first green reaches the surface of the earth is as far as they will ever put potatoes up. No sense hilling them much beyond that. I'll put straw around them to keep any surface potatoes out of the light, but there's no point in uh, hilling those ones up. Whereas these potatoes, the Pontiac Reds, are indeterminate, so I've hilled them up quite a bit, a couple times so that uh, I'll get deeper and deeper potatoes. And I had all the earth to do that stacked in a big pile right here. Well, now the pile's gone and they've been filled up. Uh, those are planted to onions, and uh, we'll get more onions coming up there. Got a plum tree here, and we get a lot of plums off that, so I'm very pleased with that. This is about year four for this tree, planted as a very young tree. Now this plum tree, sort of its companion, has a severe aphid problem. I will come out here later today, I hope, with some insecticidal 
soap and just spray it on the tips of the tree to calm the aphids down a little bit. Rhubarb, I haven't been eating as much rhubarb lately. I find it's very strong in the system, so as you can see, this one definitely went to seed. Look at all those seeds. Too bad to, I can't eat the seeds. I don't know if birds do. I'll grab still a little bit more rhubarb and mix it when the strawberries come in to make strawberry rhubarb. Now this year is not planted because, again, I want to plant some things a little bit later in the year, so I have things that come in in the fall uh, after everything else is sort of aged out and burned out and used up. I'll still get some food coming in the fall. So you get a general idea of the garden here. And uh, this is just on a city lot. The city lot's 75 feet wide, 100 feet deep. That's what we've got. And uh, you can see over there my geothermal greenhouse. I have a course out on how to build this geothermal greenhouse and how to operate it. I built it myself. And it's got mostly glass roof. There's one piece where it is the plastic roof because the glass cracked. It was really old glass, but uh, yeah, it's worked out beautifully. This is just a lovely geothermal greenhouse. There's hardly any energy. I've got uh, blueberries down here. They've got their own little bed with uh, a lot of pine needles and, and it's acidic. They like acid soil and I've made sure that this little patch of soil is what they want. They're not very old, but lots of blueberries forming right there. I just have to wait a little bit. Now this is very ugly looking. It's just a bunch of pallets, but that's almost the heart of the garden because that's my soil factory. I gather leaves from my neighbors, uh, bring in several truckloads of leaves and I put them in there and then I put grass clippings in there, not only from my own pile but from neighbors. And it ends up being this gluey kind of black mass, which smells not very nice either. And it's really powerful for the garden. It adds a tremendous amount because you're always hauling goodies out of the garden when you do weeding and things. You're taking away nutrients. You've got to keep building your soil back up if you want to garden for the long haul. Those are uh, some more of my garlic. And uh, it's doing pretty well. Won't be too much longer before they send up their little escapes. In fact, I see a couple of curling escapes over there, the, the flower part. And uh, when they straighten up, I will uh, pick the garlic. I'll have to pull some of those escapes off, though. I just leave one or two as a signal. This is straw and hay used for uh, mulching and I won't mulch until after the spring rains. We've had a very rainy spring so this stuff is still here but as soon as things dry out and I want to keep the moisture in the soil I'll spread a lot of this over the garden. There's some more of it the way that I got it from a local farmer. It cost me uh, 30 bucks for that because it was too old for his sheep but it's perfect for a garden and that came in on my pickup truck. And there is uh, what remains of my manure pile from last fall that I again got loaded from a local farmer. It's dirt, very rich in manure, and uh, it's beautiful stuff for the garden. Well, that's the, the general tour of things. Uh, I don't have a lot left in the greenhouse. You see some, pota some potatoes right there growing in buckets. It's a bit of kale, a couple of tomato plants, some plants that need to be cleaned out of there. Uh, but I do have a, a squash way in the back there with a couple of squash on it. And um, There's no maintenance to this. I just leave the windows open and I water the plants and I feed them occasionally and it, it all works out really beautifully. So I'm very pleased with this little greenhouse. There's no energy at this time here required. I do run that one little fan just to keep the air moving and that helps control insects as well. And over here, a couple of experimental potatoes in buckets, uh, planted very early in the year, kept in the greenhouse, and then brought out as soon as the frost was done. I'll be interested to see how many potatoes I can get out of there. I picked this up from a YouTube fellow, and there's some uh, carrots growing in buckets as well. Again, it's kind of experimental because I could keep these going in a greenhouse uh, for a lot of the year if I were to add lights. We do heat mostly with wood. We only use a gas furnace if we go away for a couple of days in the middle of the winter, but uh, I get 
some of my own wood from the local mill and split it and some I get already split from uh, a local provider. We buy one cord a year and then the rest I get myself. These are the shutters that go on the greenhouse in the winter. Uh, they are insulated so that it uh, keeps the greenhouse a lot warmer. You just can't have all that glass on a really cold night. Those are uh, shavings for the chickens. Really nice firewood that we get from a local provider. I built these woodsheds uh, for the property in the last couple of years. And here we have a uh, rad wagon electric cargo bike which was given to me by a close friend in the States and I'm very grateful to have that. I can carry things around the village and uh, never start up a car. Yeah, beautiful thing, especially for a senior. We've got an electric lawnmower there as well. Everything's hydropower here in British Columbia, so we're not burning fossil fuels. I don't mow the lawn very often. I should, but I don't. And then we have uh, a few buckets that you need for this sort of a mini homestead operation. The metal one there has ashes in it from the wood fire, and uh, those are spread over the garden at the appropriate time of year. We've got a compost here. This is everything that can't go to the chickens. And, uh, loaded with bugs, but that's all right. They're doing their work. Uh, I get a lot of good soil out of there. And of course, the traditional garbage can. Uh, you need to have a good ladder with wood heat so you can get up on the roof and clean the chimney uh, twice a year. And uh, yeah, that's that's about the deal. Um, there's the entrance to the greenhouse. And I've got a few strawberries growing as you go there. And another plant that I like just for the aroma. That's probably a weed, but I like it anyway. And you can see here uh, more garlic, a clematis growing. There's squash over there. The reason for that wood frame is that squash went out when there was still uh, deep frost, quite possible, so I could cover it up with a clear plastic tarp. Turns out I didn't need it this year, but I might need it next. You see the fence where tomato plants will be growing up. They've already got a, a good start there. Yeah, more strawberries, brassicas, potatoes, uh, some lovely flowers. And the whole thing is designed to produce, I would say about 20% of our food over the year comes from this area you've just seen, and certainly it would help us in tough times, and it keeps our costs way down. I couldn't afford to do my nonprofit radio show, Radio Eco Shock, if I didn't have all this food uh, to supplement our rather small budget. Well, thanks for watching, and I hope this gives you some ideas of how you could fairly rapidly convert a backyard, rip up the lawn, uh, use an old shed that you've got, uh, add chickens if you're allowed to, and if you can, and you end up with something that can uh, help keep you going through hard times. Bye-bye.